I apologize, I talk quickly, and I'm talking about a topic which I'm very excited about, which is we are going, undergoing a huge change in how we deliver innovation. And that's gonna be the story of the next hour. Uh, we've gotten to the point where instead of doing tens, you know, dozens of startup teams through projects, we've, in the last year, we've gotten to the point where we're doing hundreds and in very highly technical areas. And so the journey today is really telling you about how we got there, some of the tools we use, some of the key insights, but we are just in the middle of this massive, massive, massive change. Um, this is the Lester Center for Entrepreneurship website. If you're interested in all the fun things we do, we just had our launch startup competition, which had more than 200 teams in it. Last Thursday, our global social venture competition the week before that. Uh, a bunch of things I'm gonna talk about today are programs that are available to alumni to come through some of our training programs, and uh, all things fun start there. So where are we today in the world? So I love this graph. This is about the speed of innovation, right? The radio took, what, 40 years to get in about half a households? The iPhone took about three. Um, this is the world we live in today, and that is both a th threat to existing businesses and that is a huge opportunity, and what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is where that's an opportunity. Um, also, does anybody know what this is? Yeah. This is Watson beating people. Now, I spent decades in the artificial intelligence business, and this, this is not chess playing, this is not a ping pong playing robot, this is beating people at a knowledge and language task. This is mind blowing. Um, and again, this is the world we're in. So not only do we have insane amounts of technology innovation, insane amounts of uh, uh, innovations that none of us understand. I know I've been talking to the group at IBM that is looking for people to use the Watson platform for all kinds of different, new, exciting, innovative businesses. Um, they're very smart people. They don't know exactly what's gonna happen there either. The other thing I think that's amazing in terms of speed and pace is just the pace of startups. And of course, we all have to start with WhatsApp, right? <laughs> right, come on. How much did they get bought for? 19, 16, you know, whatever. They're, they're all just, right? Um, how many people work there? Probably more now, right? You know, they, now they, now they have, have the, the latte bringers and the, you know, right? But, that means they're up to 70, right? Uh, how many users? It's over 500 million. How many messages a day? Yeah, sorry for taking you through the guessing game, but right? Yeah, okay. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's what is available to you and to our students. Uh, I'll give you another example, one that I am personally proud of, which because it's one of my startups, which is um, something called, yeah, I know, it's bragging, sorry. So, so, this is, so Eli Lilly is the eighth largest pharmaceutical company in the world, has about 30,000 employees. Prozac, that's Lilly. Um, this is their 2009 annual report. So I started a group there called Chorus, and we did drug development. Of course, it wasn't what we started out doing, because like all startups, we changed what we were doing. But, um, but in their 2000 annual report, they said, we've doubled the number of new drug candidates entering clinical development from seven or eight a year to 16 or more a year. About three paragraphs later, Chorus, this 29-person group inside Eli Lilly, is managing 15 simultaneous drug development programs. Now, each program takes about two years. So if you do the math, 100% of this is 29 people. Um, so it's not just about software. I mean, it's tempting to think about the internet as, as the place where you see the most productivity, you see the most impact. But if you can come up with a scalable, highly leveraged model, you can create this kind of innovation in large companies as well. And that's the core of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, my favorite quote from my first, I'm finishing up my fourth year here, so, I love that, I love that, right? And so, and what is it all about, right? That's about failure. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, that's about learning. We use the word learning. That is about rapid learning 
and Sean is a brilliant guy, and he's about the fastest learner out there. Yeah, so he started seven companies, he kept one. Um, and, uh, and I think that really goes to the same kind of thing, is that you know, small organizations, small rapidly earn, er, learning organizations can deliver huge impact. And when you hit it, you can hit it big. And we have come up with a new business process for doing this, and we are delivering it at scale. Um, when I was in business school in 1996, and frankly, I will say even probably four years ago, uh, we kind of taught this process of innovation. It was very linear, right? You have an idea, you write a business plan, venture capitalist gives you some money, it's a little work, a little work in there, go public, and then you become an angel investor, right? We're all <laughs> guilty, guilty. Um, and we had a book, and the book we used, we taught here for 20 years, was this book called New Venture Creation by Jeffrey Timmons, uh, who was uh, at, at Harvard, and this was kind of written in the late 70s. Um, and they're my two favorite paragraphs out of this book. So this is, this is basically, you know, let's utilize a model that's been proven over the last 40 years, business plan writing, right? Business plan writing. How many of you were taught business plan writing here? Oh, yeah. No, we don't teach that anymore. But, but this has all changed in the last two years, I just want you to know, right? It's all changed in the last two years, and it's because we finally figured out better ways of teaching that set of skills. Because the other quote that I love out of that book is, right, it's obsolete. Once it, that's literally in the book, by the way. I, you know, I sort of have that. And, and you know, and, and, and why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it work? Because, well, I, I, so my version, yeah, I mean, I think, I think basically this is what I said, right? It assumes you already know, right? You know who your competitors are, you know what your product is, you know what the opportunity is, you know what your mission, right? You know all these things. And of course, you don't know, because even if you knew four months ago, you don't know today, because new technologies come in. Um, and I, I think, you know, if you look at startups, right, they don't know what they, they're going to be when they grow up. PayPal, right, Palm Pilots. FreshBooks, this is my favorite, actually. Wikipedia was experts only. Did you know that? It's actually in the Wikipedia entry. It's pretty cool. Wikipedia entry for, you know, right? We've all seen this. And of course, you know, we folks are all, you know, for the most part in Silicon Valley, so you all know this, right? And so, so these are all the things that kind of add up to what we're trying to deal with as educators. And this is one of my favorite teams. So we ran a program for Intel Corporation called the Technology to Market Accelerator. And from my desk upstairs at the Lester Center, along with a couple other faculty members who were not in the building, we taught 22 startups in, in 11 countries across 15 time zones. And this was a group from Russia. And it's a little hard to, to understand what he's saying, but, but listen to his journey. What I will tell you is, when they started our eight-week class, these are all computer robotics experts. And so they had built a system, a, a recognition system, an object recognition system they were going to sell to robotics companies. This was their eight-week journey. Hello, I'm Alexey Mikhaev, and I'm co-founder of Vision Labs company. On behalf of our team, I'm very glad to introduce our project. We focus on business video analytics, which helps to provide more convenient service for customers as well as reduce losses from fraudulent activities. Through the use of our recognition algorithms, we extract useful information from video stream, which helps business in decision-making process. Our team is the synergy of business and science. We are proud to work jointly with well-known scientists, top managers and experienced engineers. Have you ever thought why are the companies which are so persistent in collecting personal data of their customers, purchases, preferences, lifestyle, which are so easy to recognize them when they are using companies' web services, cannot recognize them when they came to the branch office or department store? What potential is hidden in opportunity to provide personal customer service based on the information which was collected before? This gap, the ability to provide personal offering online versus regular customer service in branches and offices, 
is a headache of the customer service director. Our solution makes it possible to eliminate this gap. It is a perfect tool to remember and recognize customers and provide them with a personalized offering based on his or her online profile. This is the place where online meets offline and all it made by Vision Labs. And all it became true by participating in Intel Technology to Market Accelerator program. Our entry point was the set of recognition technologies and our own subjective vision of how it could be applied to business. All right, I won't run it through the whole video. Did, did anyone understand what their final product was? So it's a vision system. You walk in the bank, it pulls the video off the security camera, and what does it do for the bank teller? Pulls up, yeah, pulls, pulls up your record out of the customer relationship management system. Okay. So in eight weeks, they went from, we're going to sell software to robotics companies to we're going to prevent fraud in banks. That was their second one. So in other words, they were going to pull up your face, but it was so that you couldn't withdraw money if you weren't the account owner. And so they spent a whole bunch of time with people in the fraud protection units of banks and realized those people are very conservative. They move very slowly. And their final product was uh, a system that was tied into the customer, the customer relationship management system of the bank. And when you walked in the bank, it just pulled your record up for the manager. It's like, ah, here's one of our good customers. Perhaps I should go out and make a personal greeting because somebody who has a lot of money in our bank just walked in. That is a really interesting journey. Uh, they're a very smart team. They'd been working on this for years. And, and we got them this far in eight weeks. And I'm going to tell you how we did that. So, so you know, the, the core of every business is a business model hypothesis, right? You have technology, you have product, you have who's your customer, you have your business model, which is basically how do you make money? And of course, what we've noticed about all businesses is that your first guesses are wrong. How many people have been wrong when they started a company? I can wave, I, if I had more arms, I could wave my arm, because I think I've been wrong for everyone. I think I've done eight, and I think I've been wrong uh, for, for everyone. Um, right, and, and so good teams are ones that can do this process quickly. Now the challenge of business education is the way we taught entrepreneurship is that startups were smaller versions of large companies, right? Because when you're a large company, you have to do annual budgeting, right? And so they want you to write a business plan. How much money are you gonna make this year? What are your financial projections? Oh my goodness, you were off by more than 3% last year. I certainly hope the WhatsApp folks were off by, you know, more than 3% last year. Um, and, and that's what we taught. And so, so we figured out a way of, of teaching something different. Because what we know is the process of innovation is really a search process. It's a process of searching for the right answer. It's not a process uh, of executing. Now, once you get to the right answer, or a really good answer, then you work on execution and scaling, and certainly when you look at somebody like WhatsApp, if you've got, you know, especially an information product and you've got, you know, Amazon Web Services and all that kind of stuff, you can scale very quickly. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is finding the business piece. So, so what I like to say is we've gone from new venture creation, the old model, which served us well for a long time, to customer discovery. And this is really, customer discovery is really due to Steve Blank, who's been a lecturer here at UC Berkeley for nine years. So when, you, when people say Steve Blank and Stanford, which I'm sure many of you have heard, just realize he invented it all here, and then he took it down there, and then we brought him back here. So we're very excited about that. And Steve has been great, and this is just the early, I cannot emphasize enough how early we are in this fundamental transformation. To give you an idea, Steve taught his Lean Launchpad class last year, and he taught 10 teams. We got a National Science Foundation Innovation Corps grant. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we got the Intel Technology to Market Accelerator, where we were teaching this around the world. Um, uh, we just got another um, opportunity from Intel, so we're gonna run their wearable device accelerator. So they wanna get into the wearable device business, and we're gonna help accelerate innovation in that program. So this year, our humble little Lester Center, which is five people, uh, we're gonna do over 200 teams. So we've gone from 10 to over 200 uh, in a year. So like I said, we're in the middle of this, but we're seeing bigger changes to this. And so one way to look at it is, you know, what did, what did we teach you when you were in business school, and what did I learn when I was in business school? And how does that relate 
to the kinds of things we're figuring out how to teach people now to take advantage of this really rapid innovation environment. And again, I want to be clear, this is not about startups. Startups take advantage of this. Most of the teams we teach are startups. But the reason I put that Eli Lilly example up early is because that is straight corporate innovation. That is straight redoing the business model of a large corporation. When we work with someone like Intel on their wearable accelerator, uh, they're making a bet that we can drive a faster innovation process for their wearable platform as well. They may not couch it in those terms, but that's, the, that's what I look at. The, you know, the reason they're spending their dollars and their time with us here in the Leicester Center is because they think we can drive fundamental innovation and build an ecosystem on top of their platforms in, a, in an impactful way, and that's what we're seeing. So um, if you haven't, I encourage you to um, take a look at these. These are kind of the new core textbooks. So, so new venture creation was the old set of core textbooks. You can actually take Steve's Lean Launchpad class online on Udacity. So that's the URL at the bottom. But if you just type Udacity Steve blank, it will immediately come up. It's free. Uh, you can go through the class. Now, taking the lectures is not necessarily the core of the experience, and I will talk about that, but you can get all this content, and, uh, and all the stuff we do around Lean Launchpad is free. So now, of course, we're, you know, we're here in 2014, so we do stuff online, and the way we accelerate our process, and the reason we can go from 10 teams sitting in a classroom to hundreds of teams around the world is because of a bunch of online tools. And so all the teams that go through our training programs, they watch all the lectures online, and we do not spend time in the classroom on what's in the book. Uh, we have an inside-out an inside out classroom model. Um, interestingly enough, it's all about learning. So each team has to come back into the classroom, each team that's working on an idea like the Vision Lab team, and they have to talk about what they learned, and they are coached by our faculty, venture capitalists, and seasoned entrepreneurs. Um, we use a tool called Launchpad Central, and I'll show you a little bit more about that to keep track of all this. Um, and what I'll talk about for the rest of today is really just a sub-component. We don't have time to go through sort of all the different educational components, but my goal today is to give you a flavor of the parts of the educational experience highlighted in red. And that's really a bit about business model design, customer development, which is really at the core understanding customer problems, analytics, understanding is your business model working? Is it not working from a numeric perspective? And what we call investor readiness, which is how far along are you in terms of the fundraising process? So the core of this process is what we call business model design and customer discovery. So, so you're trying to come up with a scalable business model, a repeatable, scalable process for um, building your company. How many of you have seen this, the business model canvas? Okay, well, I hope by next year, well, I guess you've all seen it now, but, but. <laughs> so interestingly enough, this is, this is kind of the, the core of the process here, is how do you get your business model onto one sheet of paper so everybody in your cross-functional team sitting around the table can understand what your business model is? And I won't, I won't go through all the boxes, but there's who are your customer segments you're selling to, what are your value propositions for those customer segments, and if you think about it, you know, a company like eBay has multiple customer segments, right? eBay has buyers and eBay has sellers, so you're gonna have a different set of value proposition depending on your customers, especially if you have a two-sided market or a multi-sided market. Uh, and the whole way this process works is when you come in and start our class, start our innovation process, you just make a set of guesses. This is who I think my customers are, this is the value I'm gonna deliver to them, this is my revenue streams, they're gonna pay me online via subscription, you know, all those things. And then we kick you out of the building and you gotta go interview 100 customers in seven weeks. 100 customers in seven weeks. To which every team I've ever seen in the program says, that is never gonna happen. <laughs> that is never gonna happen. Uh, and most of them do it. Some of them don't, and frankly, the ones that don't, uh, you know, typically are not the good ones. Um, but but it, we live in this highly connected world. I don't know if you guys have this experience, but 
almost every person I run into knows somebody I know, no matter what continent I'm on uh, in this world. And, um, and it's an amazing experience. So, so a lot of what we, you know, teach is how to get interviews, how do you get to decision makers, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and this is really to get over kind of the most important thing, which is realizing your technology, you know, your invention is not a business. And let me show you a, a video about that. So this is from a version of the class we ran over at UCSF that was focused all on healthcare startups. Two years ago, we started Vantage Realize to improve mobility for manual wheelchair users. We found through medical studies that people suffer from joint damage from using their hand rims to move around. So we developed a solution, a lever-operated device that uses a chest press motion to propel the wheelchair. For the past 10 weeks, we've been flying from Arizona to San Francisco to attend the Lean Launchpad class for healthcare startups to validate our product through the customer discovery process. Four weeks and 37 interviews into the process, we made the hard decision that we had to pivot. We interviewed many wheelchair users who liked the product, they thought it was interesting, but said they just wouldn't be willing to pay for it. We even interviewed our competitors who were struggling due to a very small market size and a lack of funds for reimbursement. We were back to the drawing board, we started revisiting needs expressed by past interviews as well as reaching out to all wheelchair users we knew, and we did a little testing of our own. About six weeks ago, my friend Charles was going to work. He hit a crack in the sidewalk and fell out of his chair. He ended up going to the ER. Solid caster wheels often get stuck and also translate a majority of impact force to the wheelchair user. We knew we could design a better caster wheel that reduces impact due to bumps and cracks on rough terrain. We're pursuing multiple patents on a deformable polyurethane wheel that is relatively inexpensive to manufacture. The casters can be made in small lots of different colors that we found were a big selling point to wheelchair users. Thanks to our manufacturing space provided by Max 6, in one week we had a looks like and works like prototype in action. Thanks to Lean Launchpad and our 80 plus interviews, including interviews with industry leaders, we validate that there is a need in the market for this product and are ready to push forward. Nice. How many customers did they interview before they pivoted? 37, yeah, right? And that's what you see all the time. And so when people ask why 100, it's only because when we run this class, we see that you know until you get 40, 50, 60, 70 in, you kind of don't know where you are. And it is most common for these teams to pivot. Now let me talk a little bit, I'm gonna flip over and talk a little bit about how we as a teaching team keep track of this. So we use something called Launchpad Central. And this is actually, this is a set of teams um, uh, we're doing actually in Saudi Arabia right now. So there's a university in Saudi Arabia called the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. It's all graduate students of science and technology. Very cool, co-ed university, 80% foreigners, really fantastic entrepreneurs. And we are running this class. Uh, we kicked off and did a week there. We've been running it for the last seven weeks online. And my, um, my uh, co-instructor actually just took off uh, a couple hours ago to go back to Saudi Arabia to finish off the class. And so what we do is you can see all the teams in the class in Launchpad Central. Um, you can see how many customer interviews they did, how many hypotheses they tested, how many they invalidated, how many times they talked to their mentors, how many times they talked to their instructors. And um, if you just say t take a look at, uh, let's pick, so Trochet, I love this team. So this is a, this is a um, Trash plus crochet. It's awesome. So what they do is they take uh, old plastic bags, they clean them, and they teach um, poor Saudi women how to knit them into very cool products that they then sell in an online store. And they are looking at um, how they do this. Now, so this is their business model canvas, and it is live, so I hope they don't mind me showing it. Um, and, uh, and I haven't looked at it before. So, so what we can, as the teaching team, do is uh, I'm going to hit the rewind button, and we're going to rewind to the beginning of the class. Oop. So 
the problem with live demos, right? Oh, we're slow. Um, and so what you'll see is these are all their hypotheses. And then the goal of the class is to go out and do customer interviews and build prototypes and, and run that rapid iteration cycle to cross stuff off the canvas. And every team has a development narrative. So every time they go out and interview a customer, talk to a mentor, um, whatever they do, they log it in the system. And so we as the teaching team and our extended team of mentors and coaches, coaches can see what the teams are doing. Are they learning? Are they talking to the right people? Is there a way we can help them? And we can do this globally. And three people, we can do about 24, 25 teams at a time. Uh, and this helps, this helps the teams keep track as well. Um, and it's really amazing, because what it is, is it's putting this business process of innovation into a system. So getting out of the business plan writing model into the customer development model and doing it at scale. Has anyone of you ever seen something like this? I've never seen something like this before. We just started using this about a year ago. Um, it's really quite an amazing system. And again, uh, all the lectures, all the content, all that kind of stuff is, is online. So you can see. Oh. Well, the video didn't load, but Steve's smiling face will come up and, and, and teach you about how to do the class. The other thing we have to teach teams how to do is how to do customer interviews. And so we developed a whole library of content around this, and, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy this. Okay. Hey, Stick. Thanks for meeting with me today. So I know that you're looking for toys that you can spend more time with your daughter playing. And we've designed this great toy that lets you do that. You can play with her and have fun, and you guys you can teach her about building and circuits. So what do you think? Well, actually, uh, that's not the kind of toy I'm looking for. I like toys that she can play with by herself because I'm pretty busy. I don't want to be showing her how to do every single step along the way. I have other things that I need to do. Oh. Can you see how this accelerates student learning? I mean, I'm not kidding, right? I mean, this, this stuff, uh, right? And so, so, so and, and trust me, we don't just show them mistakes, right? We, you know, we, te we teach them the right way. But, but this is a really important, important insight. Well, Dr. Right? Ben, thanks for giving me a little bit of your time. Uh, as I mentioned on the phone, we're working on something that is uh, very cool and I think you'll, you'll find very interesting. Uh, but before we get into that, I you know, really don't know much about uh, the types of research that you're doing and, and where this might fit into it. So I really want to ask you some questions about uh, the job that you're doing, the research that you're doing, uh, how you're using in vitro platforms, and, and where cells integrate into that. Sure. So you know, maybe just to start with, could you tell me a little bit about the research that you're doing here? Yeah. Um, so I'm the chief scientific officer at Excel. Um, we're basically looking at tumor cells. Uh, what we do is we take the tumor biopsy and then we try to culture individual cells uh, on petri dishes. Right. So could, could you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges that you've encountered, uh, maybe in particular with in vitro systems? Yeah, well, the cell-based assays are quite poor. Um, a lot of the, the, the experiments are quite challenging. Great. Uh, and could you talk a little bit more about maybe some unmet needs that you have uh, with regard to cell-based models in particular? Yeah, and we talked about this. I think one of the biggest sort of uh, pain points for us is uh, handling of the cells. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we would really like uh, a lot of cells. Um, the ability to sort of grow up these cells would be, would be very, very appealing. What else should I have asked you today? Well, that's, <laughs> I think, uh, I think the, the key thing is um, a lot of researchers really want to get access to preclinical specimens. Um, and so if you have the ability to, to guarantee that these cells are plastic in their behavior, I think that would that would be extremely powerful. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. My pleasure. A good UC Berkeley company doing bioassays. All right. Another core insight. Hi, Karina. Thanks for taking the time to talk. Yeah, sure. I'm working on a mobile app to help people track their diet. So are, are you generally a healthy eater? Oh yeah, I'm a really healthy eater. I love vegetables and fresh produce. So yeah, super healthy. Okay, great. Thanks for your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 
This is a fast learning audience, I can tell. Hi, Karina. Thanks for taking the time to talk. Yeah, sure. I'm working on a mobile app to help people track their diet. Would you say you're generally a healthy eater? Oh, yeah. I'm a really healthy eater. I eat a lot of vegetables and fresh produce. I'm very healthy. That's great. So can you tell me what you ate yesterday? Um, well, yesterday I had uh, coffee for breakfast, and then um, I was pretty busy, so I skipped lunch, and, and I was tired when I got home, so I ordered in pizza. OK. Uh, what about earlier this week? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, this week wasn't a very good week for me. So, I mean, I think I had fast food on Monday, um, and then I had, like, a burger on Tuesday, and then yet yeah, Okay, so if this week was a bad week, what about the week before that? Um, well, the week before that was more, more mixed. Yeah, I, I think I might have gone pizza again um, one, one day, but um, some of the other days were better than that, than that one. Like, what did you eat on the good days? Um, let's see. Well, I think I had some roast chicken on Monday uh, for dinner, and then on Tuesday, well, we ate out. It was someone's birthday, so uh, I think I had some meatloaf. And then for dinner, I had... Um, Sandwich. You, oh, yeah, I always have dessert. There's dessert, too. <laughs> Not a comedy routine. Um, here, I'll, I'll show you two more, because these kind of get to all the... Um... Thanks for meeting with me. I really appreciate it. I know you're super busy. And I also know your team is super busy, and they're in the field, and they're doing video, and it takes a ton of their time and costs you a lot of money. So I want to show you this really cool app that we've been developing that will help you with that. Mm -hmm. Check this out. Look how you can just mark the moment by pressing that. Yeah, it's a great product, but in our company, we don't really do a lot of video recording. Oh. But thanks a lot for coming by. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's been guilty of this? Oh, I have been so guilty of this. Wow. Um, and, but you can see how our core entrepreneurship class changes, right? Instead of telling students how to write marketing plans and working on finance and those things, it's really much more about understanding customer problems. It's about iterating. It's about being comfortable with this larger business model canvas. And that creates a, a, a huge revolution in productivity. And um, let me just skip ahead here. Um, so I warn you is there is a screenshot of somebody with a hernia. So you know, if you want to skip the first three seconds. But um, so this is a team from our, again, our, our UCSF program that we just ran in the fall. And they are working on a hernia repair. And the thing that's exciting is they have the uh, chief of general surgery at UCSF on their team. Um, the man who's talking is another surgeon. So this is a, a you know, really technically competent team. But listen very carefully to what they say. So uh, we're, we're Vitruvian Medical Devices, and our product is uh, something to treat hernias before they happen from people who have surgeries. We've had 14 interviews. We uh, changed our canvas a little bit. Um, we are talking mostly with surgeons. So of the 14 uh, interviews that we did, over two-thirds were, were with actual surgeons. Um, when we said that we had a product that might you know, cost $1,000 that would prevent a hernia, they said they would pay actually $20,000 if we had a product that could prevent a bio leak. So Hobart's pupils dilated at that point. <laughs> Hobart's not, the not, surgeon. Not the surgeons, but his pupils dilated. If we could prevent the bio leak for that surgeon, they would pay a lot more money for that. But for the, the product that we're proposing, they even thought $1,000 might be too high for that. Uh, that, that, that would be too high of a price to pay for that, that product. So these are things that we learned. Awesome. So did you feel like this was a worthwhile week? Did you learn something? Oh, it, it, it saved us probably several years worth of... No, seriously. Of, no, seriously. Because our, our thought is that surgeons would embrace this, right? And so what we didn't realize is that they're not embracing it because they don't think it's a, a problem that they have. All right, no, seriously. But again, I'm just gonna go back to this, and I know this from being an entrepreneur myself, is, I mean, they're surgeons. They have great surgeons on their team, and they do not understand the value of their surgical innovation. And they're finding out very surprising things as they go. And this is typical. And that's one of the things that's been great about going from 10 teams to uh, 200 
is you see this time and time and time again, that this, this pattern of building a business model, testing it, really learning how to do customer interviews, how to learn from customers, how to learn about bigger customer problems, is, is really an incredibly rapid um, innovation cycle. And I'm just going to uh, quickly run you through an exercise. So this is, a, this is one of the first teams we did. Um, but just kind of an exercise about like, how you do it. So, so this is a team that had a, put a GPS and a laser rangefinder and a computer on the lawnmower. Because they want to do, you know, they've got autonomous cars, right? They've got the Google self-driving car. Let's do the Google self-driving lawnmower. OK, so let's, let's go. And, and so this is their initial business model canvas, right? Mowing and weeding. Reduce operating cost, and they're going to sell. OK. So who should they go talk to? Golf courses. Who else? Parks. That's too easy. That's too easy. OK. So look what they did. They did. They went out and talked to people who weed, and they went out and talked to people who mow. And what do you think they found? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Well, and, and the reason, so, so the feedback was basically on mowing is, look, mowing is a complicated problem. You want to mow a park, you don't want to run over children, you don't want to run over dogs, uh, it's a very complicated space, um, you know, someone has to drive out there and pick up the mower and drop it off and, you know, and all those kinds of things. Uh, we already do that anyway. Um, I mean, maybe mowing at night would be some sort of incremental thing, but, like, it's not a huge problem for us right now. And that goes back to the surgical example, because what you see when you dive into this is that most people, there's a difference between being someone's number one, two, and three problem and being someone's number 10 problem. Like a huge difference. Huge, huge, huge difference. And that's really what we're teaching people to look for. Can you find a problem you can solve with, with whatever your secret sauce is that's number one, two, or three? Because if, if it's not number one, two, or three, people are not going to change their behavior. And again, the interesting thing about this is this is a bunch of people sitting down, brainstorming in a room for a couple hours, figuring out who they want to talk to, and in a very short period of time, going out there and finding it. And so this was a really good team. And so they said, well, what about weeding? And so like, great teams, they went out and they built a prototype, which they did in a week. Um, and uh, so they built CarrotBot. And so CarrotBot was to get weeds out of carrot fields. And the little, this is the computer vision system here on the right. And the little, those are weeds. So they had to build a you know, pattern recognizer for weeds. Now, what's the, problem with, what's the problem with this market? Anybody seen one of these? It's an automatic weeder. And it sprays lots of pesticides. OK. So they were very depressed this week. <laughs> Someone had already thought about our problem. And so, so, um, so our job as the teaching team in these programs, we call ourselves coaches, not consultants. Right? Our job is not to tell you you have a terrible idea. Um, and frankly, we don't know. Right? I mean, what's the hit rate of most Silicon Valley venture capitalists? Right? Experienced venture capitalists. right? Home runs, under 15%, right? The best, the brightest. I work in the pharmaceutical industry, so the chorus thing I did at Eli Lilly, if a drug has good animal data, does anyone know the odds it's going to ship to market and generate revenue? Someone said it, 5%, right? And, and that's a really interesting insight, right? Which is, if you get the smartest people, and I know the people I work with at Eli Lilly are really smart, and you put them in a room with a bunch of data, and they can pick one in 20, that, that shows you need a different business process, right? You need a business process that's oriented around failure, not a business process that's oriented around success. And so as the teaching team, when we're coaching, it's, again, it's not our job to say we know, you know 
physicians don't buy software in healthcare companies, uh, which we know, it's to get the team out there learning and, and growing. Um, something we can do very efficiently. So we kicked them back out of the building and they went out and talked to organic farmers, right? Not gonna spray pesticides. They're not gonna have giant weeding machines. Um, and so they actually ended up having a, uh, a market for their product. And one of the things that we see over and over again is so this was their final canvas at the end and they're actually pursuing this idea. None of the boxes is the same. None, right? I mean, and, and, and it's really interesting, right? Because once you dive into it, you know, they didn't have time to sort of fully get the canvas out in seven weeks, but it's even, it's equipment rental, right? Farmers don't buy equipment, they lease it or they rent it. Um, you know, and this is why the business plan piece doesn't work. Um, and of course, another thing that can happen, I'm gonna show you another video, and this is a team that went through our um, uh, National Science Foundation Innovation Core as well. Let me see if I can get the mouse here. Oops. Oh. Hold on, let me fire up PowerPoint again here. So I was talking about a high failure rate process. Um, and so, hold on. Well, I hope this works, because this, this is another great team. There we go. Chia Chen. Carrie Wilson, team mentor. Sunny Shaw, EO. And we are Team, team RapiSense. Developing a fast, easy to use test for detection of foodborne pathogens. To commercialize, I used to think we have people, technology, all we need is the money but quickly realized that customer discovery is the most important piece of the puzzle. In the beginning, I got several nightmares of the teaching team yelling at me, especially John Bacon saying, No sleeping, Sonny. You should be getting out of the building. We got out of the building and visited industries from across the country. Getting the interview was the hard part. If you shut up and listen, customers love talking. 37% of my interviews lasted more than an hour, which then led to a lot of quick learning. One of our early mistakes was made in the first day of interviews when we met a few independent butchers. We jumped to an early conclusion that this would be a new market segment for our technology. We learned quickly that this was not the right segment to pursue, and it was chopped from our canvas. As for interesting experiences, I had slaughterhouses think I was a PETA activist, or a food testing lab convinced that I was a big company marketing guy. On the brightest side, I had a wonderful interview with Len Chapel and even got featured in their monthly newsletter. Judy Adams even quantified her pain for us. Jim Fish of Park 100 Foods numerically explained how the cost of maintaining an on-site testing lab was far higher than him outsourcing to a contract lab. That was the final nail in the coffin for an original on-site testing value prop and we pivoted to contract labs. The need was clear. But from our interviews, we realized that our technology cannot address the bottleneck of the testing time, which left us with a mediocre value prop. The lessons learned from customer discovery have been truly phenomenal. Former Groupon CEO said, have the courage to start with the customer. Don't let your intuition override what's best for them. In my words, don't just develop something fancy. Listen to what your customers want. Are they gonna keep going? Um, and that's a really interesting part about this process is, so, so the actual class that we run is about two months long. We drive every team out to do 100 customer interviews. And the actual goal of the class is to get we, to what we call a go or a no-go. Should we keep going or should we declare we have learned enough? I didn't say failure, right? Have we failed? Well, you know, whatever, right? Go or no go. Now, the interesting thing about most of these, especially when we run these programs for the National Science Foundation, so when we run National Science Foundation programs, it's things like this, right? Bacterial testing, 
nanomaterials, uh, horse probiotics, that, that was a good one, um, and most of them are no's. But we get it done in less than two months. That's what's interesting, right? Now you're starting to see what's interesting about the process, right? We can run it at scale with hundreds of teams. We can get pretty good answers in a couple of months. And this is the real thing, right? This is not another iPhone app. This is not another, uh, you know, sort of software product or website. This is real deep tech. And this, the speed at which these teams learn is just phenomenal. Now it brings up another question, which is when you're a go, what do you do next? And so we start with a business model canvas. That was one of the books, right? We do the customer, customer interviews, customer development process. That was the Steve Blank uh, Startup Owner's Manual book. And then there's a third book we use called Lean Analytics. And I highly recommend you read it because what it does is it takes the business model canvas framework and it says if you're building a scalable business model, how do you measure how well it's going? How do you measure how well it's going? And what they start with is what I will call patterns. So what are patterns, what are typical business models that are already out there that have metrics? And, and let me show you one of those. So this is straight out, this is straight out of the Lean Analytics book. So this is the, the mobile, right? You have a mobile app. How do you side, decide whether you have a viable, high growth business? Well, that business model is actually, it's a pattern, right? Many people repeat that pattern and they have done a great job of instantiating what it is, right? So, so you have ratings and some of the ratings you pay for some of the ratings your customers give, and some of the ratings you give yourself. I don't know, fraudulent, you guys here? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? Incentivized, legitimate, and fraudulent ratings. Um, that leads to reviews, you get search, you get on the leaderboards, people buy, people download, people install, people activate, they play your game, or they don't, and, right? And this is another interesting thing, right? If you come up here and you see what they have here is something so many startups forget about with their product, right? Which is disengagement, which is if someone comes in and uses your product and stops using it, what is it saying about your product? I don't need it, right? It's not, it's not doing anything for me. And so with these kinds of frameworks between the business model template, the customer interviews, and these frameworks, startups, and companies building new businesses can very rapidly create dashboards of their key metrics. And of course, we are in the era of big data. Um, and so it's much easier to measure with Google AdWords, with instrumentation off the back end of your product, and actually build a dashboard for what you're doing. And interestingly enough, for this whole process, there's a, there's a whole new set of metrics that we're developing around the innovation process uh, itself. And so this goes right to the canvas, right? And so these are really metrics which is, are fundamentally about how rapidly are you innovating and how much value is your product delivering. And being able to get to this level of specificity, as I said, is a brand new and exciting era, right? And it's things around how many hypotheses did you test? How many did you validate? How many did you invalidate? Um, you know, do you understand your acquisition costs to customers? Do you understand, right? And so, so it's really creating a framework for optimizing the process of innovation. Does anyone have any questions about this? Stunned you into silence. Batter lunch is finally kicking in. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about one, one more notion before I wrap up. And that is, so we've talked about customers at the heart of the process. We've talked about the business model and understanding and testing your business model as the core of the innovation process. We've talked about putting in place metrics to measure whether your business model is succeeding or failing, as well as whether your innovation process 
is going rapidly. The next piece is, is, is understanding, do you have a business that's ready to scale? And so uh, Steve Blank and some of his colleagues invested something called the, uh, the investment readiness level. Now this comes out of something called the technology readiness level. Has anyone ever had to do these? Anyone ever done a government contract? Ah, so we have at least one person who has done a government contract besides me in the back. Um, and uh, and so, so this is a, a system built by the government to, um, you know, it's really, it's a formal way to assess project maturity, right? And so, so, so kind of low numbers mean you're not very organized, um, and, you know, your product's not very far along, it's not ready to scale, it's not ready to ship. Uh, and this has been adopted by NASA and DOD, you know, a whole, whole bunch of people to really understand the maturity of programs. It's a very interesting thing. So, and just, you know, as an example, you know, if you're up in levels kind of seven, nine, and eight, right, you've done system development, your system's deployed in the real world, um, and you're out there doing interesting things. Um, and of course, you know, you can think the same thing about startups, right? You've got your product in your lab, now it's out in the real world, you're really getting customers and metrics. And so, what we've put together is a way of having these teams themselves measure, are they ready for investment? And interestingly enough, it's based all on the canvas. So if you're down in the ones and the twos, your value proposition is summarized, right? And you, you've basically started filling out your canvas. So you have about this, right? And this is the first thing, right? Is can you deliver value to customers? That's the core of the process. Do you have customer segments that want to buy your product? Can you deliver value to them? Sometimes that's called product market fit, and you'll, you'll hear that term bandied about. Then the next one is you've built uh, what's called a minimum viable product, so you're actually trying to deliver value to the customers with your product. And you're trying to build that right-hand side of the canvas. So customer segments, value propositions, and then you're starting to get to how do you actually deliver value to customers, right? How do you deliver value, right? So what are your channels? How, you know, how is your product reaching your customers? Are you selling it online? Um, are you delivering it in person? Uh, is it something they own? Uh, and what kind of relationships are you having with your customers, right? How are, how are they using your product? How are you measuring it? How are you getting them to buy more? All those kinds of things. Um, and essentially, that's about what is the, what is the potential. Because, of course, revenue stream includes how much people are willing to pay you. And then five and six is basically validating, I'd call it the rest of your channel, right? Can you have partnerships? Can you go to scale? And then you end up getting, basically, do you have the full piece? Do you have a sustainable business? And that's where you get to these metrics that matter. I know that's a pretty quick run through that process. Um, all right. Let me wrap up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk again about scalability. So, so hopefully you've seen in this short period of time the core of the process, how we can run it, how we can run it with a lot of teams. I'm going to run through results. So, so one is just sheer numbers of teams. So we run a program called the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. Half the teams are National Science Foundation investigators who've received government grants, so that's all core technology. Half of the teams are from, that we train are from the Bay Area. It's free, we're running it this summer. We're taking applications right now. I'll, I'll pop the website up as well. Um, and so we're deploying this process across the country at scale. Um, another part of this that's really exciting is we're deploying it globally. So I, I talked to you about the Intel Technology to Market Accelerator. So we're, we train teams in more than 20 countries and in over, uh, over 200 teams total. And what's interesting about this process that we just learned is it works everywhere. So we're doing teams in Saudi Arabia, we're doing teams in Kenya, we're doing teams in Brazil, we're doing teams in Jordan. India, China. Um, a year ago, people would tell me, Andre, this isn't going to work in conservative cultures. This isn't going to work in cultures that don't understand risk. That is simply not true. Because we've done dozens and dozens of teams around the world. Um, and that really goes on to the, what I will call the, the, you know, the, the grand frontier of innovation 
and conservative cultures, which are corporations. I got a chuckle, that was good. And this is where, this is where we are, which is, we're trying to do this at scale within larger organizations. So now one of the things that's interesting here is I work at UC Berkeley, which is a large organization. And we have lots of innovators, but I will not claim we have a strong innovation process. So does anyone know how much the US government invests every year in research at UC Berkeley? It's a good number. $700 million. $700 million. Does anyone know what the net of the UC, so not just Berkeley, but the entire UC, so the intellectual property licensing offices of all of the University of California universities, does anyone know what their net revenue is annually? 20, say that again? 20 million, you're close, 36 million. Now, now, admit it, look, the goal of a university is not, you know, we are not Kleiner Perkins, right? Let's, you know, let's be very careful about the metrics. Um, but if you look across universities, so 80% of university technology licensing offices lose money. Um, and so we are in an organization that does a huge amount of social good. We teach students. We do cutting edge research. How many Nobel Prize winners do we have? 34? I mean, it's amazing. But in terms of delivering that innovation into society, Personally, you know, I, and, and I, I don't say this badly in terms of the UC Berkeley Intellectual Property Licensing Office, because frankly, I think our, our licensing office is very forward thinking. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem that as a large organization we face, which is even though we have an insane research budget, we have incredible innovators, we still are not good at delivering that innovation out into the world. And I think a lot of large corporations are the same way. And one of the reasons I am so very excited about this process, even though we are in the very early days and you are seeing things in the middle of being built, is because what we see with, with startups is just insane progress. And here, I'm gonna skip a few uh, slides here and sort of get to the, the does it work. So, um, so does it work? So one of the most exciting results, we've only been doing the program for the National Science Foundation for a year. And, and as you, you saw before, nationwide, between us and the other four nodes that do this across the country, they've, um, we've done 289 teams total. The National Science Foundation spends about $7 billion a year on research. So they give out $7 billion a year in research grants. They give about $2 billion a year out in commercialization grants. So these are SBIR and STTR grants, right? So if you come up with an invention, on, based on NSF technology, and you want to commercialize it, they'll give you a commercialization grant. And um, the first metric we have out of this Innovation Core program is that if you apply for an SBIR grant um, and you haven't been through the program, the odds you will get one are 18%, 1-8%. If you have been through the program, it's 60%. That's in a year. Um, I was happy to note we just ran our startup competition. Two of our eight finalists teams had been through the program. One of them was a team that did mercury detection, which is a hard market, fundamental technology, all that kind of stuff. It was really great to see them uh, get through the program. Uh, that online program I ran with Intel, so not only did that Russian team, remember the Russian team, the bankers? So by the end of the program, they were installed in five of the top 10 largest banks in Russia. Now, that was a good team, too, right? I mean, I won't, I won't put that all on us, but they were doing computer vision when we started, you know, but in two and a half months. Um, and three of those teams got angel investments as well. Um, and of course, let us not forget the no-goes. That's why that Vitruvian medical team is to me is a, is a you know is a powerful story when really really smart people stand up. This, that's the hernia team, right? And they said this probably saved us a few years. 
So the learning you get with a no-go is just incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and in terms of where this is going, um, I'm very excited that we're doing this for the National Science Foundation, we're doing it at scale. The National Institutes of Health, which is four times the size of the National Science Foundation in terms of funding, they give about $30 billion a year, they are gonna pilot this program in healthcare. Uh, of course, we ran the global program with Intel. Um, we are running the Intel Make It Wearable Challenge. If you know anybody who has a wearable device and they're interested in using Intel technology on it, uh, they should go there. Intel's giving away $1.3 million. Or I should say the CEO of Intel in November is gonna give away $1.3 million to the top teams that go through that program and we are taking them through this program. And that's a massive new play to help corporations build innovation on top of their platforms. Very exciting. Don't have the results from that for you yet, but we are in a very exciting place. I am also very excited. We're gonna be launching a social lean launchpad course in the fall with Will Rosenzweig of Physic Ventures and Jorge Calderon. Um, so they're taking this framework and they're trying to figure out how can we create social ventures with higher impact and get them in a really great place in terms of testing their business models. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with uh, one last video uh, from another healthcare team. I'm Howard. I'm Kent. I'm Brandon. My name is Aaron Neinstein. I'm Dr. Sally Adi. My name is Ben. My name is Jana. My name is Janice. My name is Eric. My name is Ian. Oh, Jamie. I'm Sarah Krugman, and I'm a designer. I'm a software developer. I'm an endocrinologist. I'm a software engineer, and I have type 1 diabetes. I work for type, and I have type 1 diabetes. I'm a software developer, and I have type 1 diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes. My uncle has type 1 diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes. My daughter has type 1 diabetes. My pancreas stopped producing insulin. It's an autoimmune disease. But no one knows why it happens. Type 1 diabetes has no cure. I depend on insulin to live. It's different than type 2 diabetes, when your body still makes insulin, but it just doesn't work as well. Insulin can be a life-saving drug. But too much insulin can kill me. Too much insulin causes hypoglycemia. Too much insulin can cause your blood sugar to go low, which can cause a seizure. Or a coma. But if I don't take enough insulin, my blood sugar goes high. Which can lead to blindness, kidney failure, amputations. Figuring just the right dose of insulin is really hard. My devices don't talk to each other. And the software that comes with them is way too hard to use. There's all this data, but there's no way to make sense of it. There's no way to bring it all together in one place. There's no way to remember what happened last time I ate this burrito. No way to remember how my body reacted last time I went for a long bike ride. There's no way to know that she's safe when she's away at a sleepover. It's a huge burden for us and our patients. We deal with this all day, every day. But we're not letting it slow us down. We formed Tidepool because we have a vision for an open data platform and better applications that'll reduce the burden of type 1 diabetes. We choose to be a nonprofit and open source because it lets us help everyone, everyone, everyone with type 1 diabetes. Even though we're nonprofit, we need to generate revenue. We need to build a business so that Tidepool can grow and sustain itself. Which is why we joined the Lean Launchpad at UCSF. We had so many questions. You might call them hypotheses. They were guesses. They were guesses. Yeah, we had guesses. We had guesses. Who was our customer? Was was it the doctor? Was it the device maker? Or the parents of kids with type 1? Or was it me? Or was it me? The Lean Launchpad class gave us the framework we needed to test these guesses. We talked to over 100 people. Over 100 people? People with type 1 diabetes. Doctors who take care of people with type 1. We talked to lots of device makers. Parents of kids with type 1. Lots and lots of device makers. We asked what mattered to them. After about 50 interviews, an amazing thing happened. Themes started to emerge. Some of our guesses were right, some were wrong. We learned that our early adopters weren't who we thought they were. And we learned that our product was way more valuable than we thought. Way more valuable. Way more valuable. And then it got even better. Device makers started calling us and saying, how can we work with you? People at conferences were putting us in their slides. Bloggers started writing about us. Key opinion leaders started talking about us. All because we had gotten out of the building. We had gotten out of the building and asked them what we should do. We had a nerve. They all wanted to help us get the answers right. So thank you, Lean Launchpad, and thank you, UCSF. Thank you, mentors and instructors. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for getting us out of the building. Because of you, we're no longer Longer guessing. We know how to build a scalable business. We are building Tidepool. We are building Tidepool. We are building Tidepool. And we will forever change the way people think about the treatment of type 1 diabetes.
Thanks. So we just have a couple minutes here at the end. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, step up to the mic. Please. So my name's Dan Condi, and I have a question about competition. So if you sure. realize after you've innovated and you've validated that there's some inkling that some competitors are coming up, do you use the same technique to potentially find a different niche that works, or is that just an execution issue to deal with the competition? So, um, so my opinion is, I, I think it's a really good question, right? Um, and it points to a deeper question, right? He's asking about competition and what do you do when you find competition. I mean, my personal opinion, having been a serial entrepreneur, is that it is always about execution. Um, the customer development process can help you find whether there's entrenched competition when you start, right? In other words, a lot, of, a lot of ideas, people come out and there's already an entrenched competitor who's raised tens of millions of dollars and, you know, that makes it a tough slog. But, um, but one of the things we're trying to do is to get people to innovate faster and make them better at executing. And that's why we talk about lean analytics and metrics that matter, right? What are ways we can help you understand whether you're outpacing your competitors, whether you're finding markets and customer segments they don't understand? And so we're really trying to teach you a whole framework to get to exactly that issue. How do you outpace your competition? Answer your question? Good. Uh, uh, class of 88. Um, when you get out of the building, you know, you might, I mean, you're obviously revealing some of the information about your product out there in the marketplace. Is that really a risk, or is, uh, is, is revealing so little of a risk in relation to the intelligence you're getting that you're not worried about it? Well, I look at, that's a great question as well, right? Which is if you're going out and talking to customers, especially, you know, frankly, if you're in with people who might be your competitors, are you revealing too much? And so, and they're really, to me, there are really two answers to that question. So one thing is that we, we always um, talk to the teams about not revealing your secret sauce. So my example of that is one of the early teams we had. They had a way of calculating uh, a certain number a million times faster than anybody else. And they said, well, how are we going to ask people about this? And I said, well, you know, the point is whether anyone is willing to pay for the answer a million times faster, not how you generate the answer a million times faster. And I think that's often something, you know, so, so that's, that's one uh, nuance. Um, the other is that Competitors can't do everything. And especially when you look at large companies, um, how many of you have read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma? Right, yeah, oh good, a, a lot of people. So if you haven't read it, it's a great book. It's by a guy named Clay Christensen. Again, it's The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's basically, if you look at markets, when there are technology disruptions, the companies that lead before the disruptions are not the companies that lead after. And if you look at computers, you know, it was IBM with the mainframe, Data General, or uh, digital equipment with the mini computer, you know, uh, Dell with the PC, you know, obviously you get all the way down to Apple with the smartphone, and if you look at video streaming, or if you look at delivering videos, it was movie theater chains, you know, and then Blockbuster, and then Netflix, and now Apple streams more movies than Netflix, right? So, um, so you see disruption. So the other way I look at it is if you're, if you're using disruptive innovation, you typically don't have to worry about competition. It's only if your business is, is me too. So. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I'm Sanjit, class of 2009. Um, this obviously works really well for very early stage companies. Um, what advice would you give to um, entrepreneurs that have raised money and where the pressure to grow overrides the ability to take a couple months and, and do this process? So. Um, So this, this process is for early stage innovation, and one of the things we're building out this year is classes and the infrastructure to try to stay, take stuff further, right? So this gets to go, no go, and then what we're building is to what we call customer validation, which is can you build something customers wanna buy? That's basically kind of my short version of customer validation. Uh, to answer your question, read the Lean Analytics book because the Lean Analytics book is really about getting you focused around the right execution numbers and forming kind of the next level of hypotheses, more refined hypotheses on your canvas, right? In other words, if we, you know, we think we're delivering a lot of value to, to this customer segment, and yet when we run the analytics, we see that they install our app, but they never use it, right? Or they start using it, and then they stop using it, right? And so, so you start diving in on that cycle. Um, it really doesn't take you that long. Like, if you can't sit down and write your business model, 
on this canvas, um, you don't know what your business model is. And if you can't write down the analytics, you know, what are your key metrics and your metrics that matter, then you don't really understand your business model either. And so I would highly encourage you to especially read the Lean Analytics book and try to chart those numbers on the business model canvas and understand it, because it'll, it'll help everybody in your company understand what it is you're trying to get done and how to measure success. And you'll have some great debates, right? No, seriously, right? You will have great debates. Does this number matter? Does that number matter? That kind of stuff. But the point is it's so much easier to measure these days than it used to be. Uh, you'll see. I hope that answered your question. One more question? Oh, one more question. Hi, Deborah Stern, uh, class of 84. I have a question about a rapid process for coming up with your, uh, your business model hypothesis. If you have you know, three or four possibilities, is there a, a process to work through that? That's what the customer interviews are. And so, so what, what you should do is, if you've got three different, fundamentally different business models, I would make three different canvases, and I would test all three, right? So what would it mean if we were you know, making the product and selling it direct to customers? I mean, a lot of times you can put these all on the same canvas, frankly, especially if you're selling to the same customer segment. But if you're selling, if one idea is to sell to com one customer segment, and then another idea is to, you know, is to, well, say you have a product model to one customer segment is one idea, and then a service model to a completely different customer segment is a different idea. Those are two different businesses, I would argue. And that's why you should just start doing customer interviews. So do, you know, do 30 for this one and do 30 for that one, and you will start to see patterns. So and, you, and, don't, and, you, you don't test two different models to the same interviewee. You you would break it out, is that what you're well, saying? Well, that's where you're trying to understand their problems, right? Because what'll happen is you'll, if you understand their problems and you understand sort of how they, how they pay for value right now, you will probably start to see that one of those business models is closer to the pattern of what they're doing today. Like one of the things we always tell uh, people is to try to, like if people are used to paying for things monthly, if your revenue model is to charge monthly, it's much easier for them to say yes, right? Um, like the genius of Salesforce.com was when they came out, their original pricing was cheap enough that a VP of sales who had a team of 10 salespeople could pay for their product on, you know, she could pay for the product on her individual credit card below her monthly expense limit. Right? You do, I guarantee they found that out. You know, I, I guarantee they didn't figure, but they figured out what that number was and started charging below that number, so that person never had to get approval or IT approval or anything. But, I mean, do, do you see how that sort of ties into your model, right, as you're trying to, once you start getting out there and talking to customers, you'll start to see patterns emerge, and it'll become much easier to pick between those models. And by the way, that's why we say 100 customer interviews as well which is the, the, the worst mistake you can make is talk to three people and say, there's no chance here. Um, you, you have to talk to dozens and dozens of people. If there's any key insight from this whole process, it's you have to talk to dozens and dozens of people because what happens is you'll start to see patterns and you'll start to ask better questions. It's that loop, right? You start to see patterns and then you start to know what sort of questions to ask and then you understand how to refine your business model and you just have to talk to a lot of people.